One of the first things, one of the first reactions I get when people learn that I was an M&A lawyer and particularly actually when I was an investment banker, uh, first thing people said is, you must be really rich. I'm not, uh, but um, that's a different story and a different set of choices. Uh, one of the reasons for that is these are big deals. We talk about, well, some of them are small, but many of them are substantial amounts of money and clearly price and the payment terms are a key element, a key condition in any transaction document, uh, whether we're structuring as a SPA or a BSPA. So there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about price in particular. Um, let's see how we go. This might be one or two videos because I want to focus in on a particular type of pricing clause, talk about earnouts in particular. So when we're talking about price or value, we're talking about identifying the amount of money or the consideration that the buyer is going to pay in exchange for, so a promise to pay money in exchange for the promise to transfer the shares and as a consequence, everything that sits underneath the shares in the company or the specified assets uh, and liabilities. So basically when we're talking about price, um, often the negotiation is about identifying the value of the business. And it's usually things like a, a combination of uh, the stock, debtors, fixed assets that are utilized in the business. Uh, it might be sold with or without debtors and creditors. So even when it's a share sale, there may well be an accounting at a period of time where uh, the price is determined on the basis that any amounts that are owed to the business in relation to things that it did before that time are actually payable across to the uh, to the vendors. Um, and the ultimate purchase price might also be adjusted to reflect assets or liabilities that don't form part of the sale. So particularly with a BSPA, the overall business value might be identified, but uh, once you've decided that a particular machine or a particular property isn't going to be transferred across to the new owner, then essentially that value is uh, held, continue to be held by the vendors, which means in turn that the price will be lower. Um, Businesses can also have a negative value. One of the first big M&A transactions I worked on um, was back in the 1980s, it's so long ago, involved um, the sale of uh, half of a mining project at a place called Savage River in Tasmania. Uh, and essentially that was a joint venture initially between an American and a Japanese mining company and the Japanese were divesting their interest so that the American company would become the 100% owner. Uh, and essentially, it really confused me at the time, the Japanese company paid the Americans to take over their share. Why? Because the mine, which had been running for 40 or something years, uh, had left, unfortunately, some really uh, dangerous and long-lasting negative environmental impacts. And the promises that the joint venture had made to the Tasmanian government in relation to clean-up means, meant that when the mine itself was being closed down, the costs of clean-up would be extensive. Uh, and so the asset actually had a negative value and the purchaser received money to take over the other half. So it's not something that happens often, uh, but in those kind of second circumstances, it does happen. Uh, and so when we're talking about drafting a uh, purchase price clause or clauses that deal with purchase price, we need to think about a range of things. We need to think about uh, the timing, uh, not only the amount, but the timing of the amount. Is it all going to be paid at the time that the shares or the assets transfer, or is some of it going to be defined? Third, uh, for later payment based either on uh, improvements to the business or uh, some calculation of profitability, that's often what we call an earn out, or will it be deferred because some of it will be withheld by the purchaser just in case some of the warranties are uh, don't end up being true or complete or that there are additional expenses that need uh, that have been allocated to as a responsibility of the vendor um, purchase prices 
uh, purchase price clauses often include adjustment provisions. Uh, and this is particularly the case if there is a deferral. Uh, so if you go in and have a look at the Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedent, go and have a look at the long form and have a look at some of the options for pricing clauses. And you will see that often uh, there's a stock take. So there is a point in time where value is ascertained, particularly if it's a trading business. Um, and there'll be some kind of formula for um, allocating those adjustments between the parties. So they might include things like accrued uh, employment entitlements, for example, uh, or the amounts that the business can expect to have deposited into its bank account from payment on invoices, etc. Um, another thing that is quite common when we're talking about price, so price isn't always cash. Price might also be shares. So this is when we have a quasi-merger. Remember, under Australian law, even though we call it mergers and acquisitions, we don't actually have a, a merger transaction type in the way that they do in other places, particularly the US. The scheme of arrangement is the closest thing we have. Uh, but a uh, an acquisition that involves the issue of shares in the acquirer basically results in all of the, the subsidiary or, or the company, the target company, becoming a new subsidiary of a larger company and the shareholders, people who were shareholders of that old company, becoming shareholders in uh, the acquirer. And so that's a situation where there needs to be consideration as to well, what is the value of those shares both before and after the acquisition takes place. Should some of those shares be held in escrow? So it's quite often, particularly if the acquirer is a, a, a listed company, that the provisions will sometimes, as required by the ASX listing rules, sometimes just as a commercial process, um, oldies like me call it escrow, but the technical language is uh, that there'll be a retention agreement, uh, which is essentially an agreement that means that the um, the new owner of those shares, they'll get the benefits of those shares in terms of voting, in terms of any dividend, but there'll be a restriction on those shares that will prevent them from selling those shares until a period of time has elapsed, uh, just in case the owner needs to call them back in some place. And clearly, when shares are consideration, tax issues come into play as well. So when we're allocating or deciding what price or consideration is, um, my really oversimplified formula here uh, will work as a starting point when we're thinking about either a BSPA or a SPA. We're looking at the value of the assets or the underlying assets, if we're talking about a share, less the liabilities, plus the goodwill equals price. Uh, now, often price is determined as a multiplier of, say, revenue. So uh, the way I think about multipliers is um, we're really looking at how many years will it take you to pay to, uh, to buy that kind of profitability? So when it's a revenue or a profit multiplier, so if we're talking, say, of an EBIT of two, what we're saying is that um, two years worth of profits will pay for this, bill, uh, this business. So that would largely be a pretty stable largely uninteresting business most likely. High multipliers tend to be high risk uh, and, um, and and where there's a lot more uh, at stake. So particularly in um, when we have these little tech bomb things that happen from time to time, we see that the earnings are quite low, but the capital value of the shares is quite high. But ours is not to teach a valuation class. I just want you to know that the legal agreements need to reflect the price as negotiated. Those of you who are in business will be looking at this valuation question in different contexts. Uh, and ultimately, this is one area where the business and the lawyers need to work very closely together because the lawyers need to understand the true intention when it comes to pricing to make sure that the words accurately reflect what the parties intend and capture that goodwill amount. Good 
will, it's, it's kind of, it's a technical term and it can be a little bit hard to get your head around. It generally refers to the value of business beyond its tangible assets. Uh, so the things like buildings, equipment and inventory, they're easy to value. Um, goodwill is those non-tangible elements. Um, it might be the, the value of the brand, uh, customer loyalty, favourable business relationships. Goodwill is the extra value that makes one business more profitable or more desirable is probably a better word than another. Um, when it comes to defining what goodwill is, uh, legal definitions of goodwill have been shaped by various court cases. Uh, these include decisions by the High Court, in fact. So two that I've got on the screen are the Box and the Place a Dome case. Um, these cases illustrate that goodwill is difficult to define precisely because it can vary depending on context. In Box, the High Court explored how goodwill is linked to the business's ability to attract and retain customers. And in Placer, uh, it further, it accepted Box, but also further clarified that while goodwill is often associated with customer relationship, it can stem from other things like location, business reputation, even the unique methods that a business, business uses to operate. So um, this definition, which was uh, referred to in Heppel's um, and also in Place a Dome, actually comes from a, a, a very old um, UK case. Um, and I think uh, the definition here is probably the most useful one still. What is goodwill? It is a thing very easy to describe and very difficult to define. It's the benefit and advantage of the good name, reputation and connection of a business. It is the attractive force which brings in custom. It is the one thing which dis distinguishes an old established business from a new business at its first start. The goodwill of a business must emanate from a particular centre or source. However widely extended or diffused its influence may be, goodwill is worth nothing unless it has the power of attraction sufficient to bring customers home to the source from which it emanates. Goodwill is composed of a variety of elements. It differs in its composition in different trades and in different businesses and in the same trade. So if we think back to social media companies, I remember a few years ago, uh, you might have seen there's lots of hype about how companies like Meta or Facebook or Google, Amazon, these big tech companies had massive valuations even though 15, 20 years ago, they had very small revenues. Uh, and a lot of people are like, well, what are the business fundamentals here? But what they did have was users or customers. So their massive valuations at the time represented goodwill. Now, most of these companies are incredibly profitable now. But it is a model that we see even new companies that are able to attract customers, even if they're not profitable, can attract goodwill eh, commercially from time to time. It's worth noting that accountants and lawyers approach the idea of um, goodwill slightly differently. And so when you as a lawyer are talking to accountants, it's worth actually making sure that you think about this. For accountants, goodwill is often treated as an intangible asset recorded on a balance sheet. It's usually simply the difference between the purchase price and the fair value of its identifiable assets and liabilities. For lawyers, however, goodwill is more as a legal right or a privilege that comes with operating the business. It's recognised as property in itself, but unlike other assets, it can't be separated from the business. The distinction is important when you're drafting or interpreting these kinds of agreements. So the legal principles or the key legal principles for goodwill are that goodwill is considered a form of property distinct from other business assets, though it's inseparable for the business itself. It represents the right to use the business's reputation and customer base to generate income. Secondly, goodwill contributes significantly to the overall value of the business. If someone is buying a business, they're not just purchasing physical assets, but the intangible benefits like customer loyalty and brand reputation that makes a business successful or will contribute to its future success. 
It's also worth noticing that courts have taken both a narrow and a broad view. These days, they are moving from that narrow view, seeing goodwill as primarily customer loyalty, to a broader understanding that includes those additional factors like brand name, location, operational methods, secret source, those kinds of things. So when we move forward, um, in a later video, I'm going to have a bit of a chat about restraint clauses. I'll probably do that when I talk about employees as well. Uh, the reason for pointing this out is when you think about it, the purpose of a restraint clause is to protect goodwill. And I think that that is an important issue for us to think about. Also, I'm going to do this in a separate video. I want to talk specifically about another pricing mechanism. I highlighted this earlier, the earnout. I think this will be important to you and you might want it in a separate video just in case it's relevant to your assignment. Might be, might not. Cheers. <laughs>